The world's biggest leaders and experts in the energy industry are in Houston this week discussing the industry's biggest goals and challenges. It's all part of the 42nd annual gathering of Sarah Week, the world's preeminent energy conference hosted by S&P Global. Now, we've heard from quite a few industry leaders on our show this week. Our next guest is in Houston now for the conference. We've got Kate Height, Bain and Company partner and energy policy expert. Um, Kate, you know, this conference comes at a time where uh, you sort of get the sense that Yes, companies are still investing in this clean energy transition, but it's not as top of mind maybe as it was a few years ago, partly because the shareholder pressure has eased back. What's your takeaway so far in the conversations that you've been having? I think right now we're in the middle of companies actually trying to sort out what it looks like to invest in this environment. We The time of pledges has passed and we're now in the middle of the heart of implementation. So I think the direction of travel continues to be clear in terms of investment in new energy technologies. It's just the pace that's a little bit uncertain. And sort of that's what we see showing up in the survey that we recently did of about 600 executives on the topic. And Kate, speaking of uh, speaking up that research, in terms of the return on investment, we're, we're still seeing companies wanting to invest here, but some caution here about how what, how they're viewing ROI. What are you see, seeing from some of these companies and where are they seeing the greatest ROI? So I think we're seeing a time of, you know, increasing interest rates really impacting the ability to put capital to work in this area right now. So I think there's a lot of sort of capital on the sidelines waiting for those rates to come down so it can really take off. So I do think it's a matter of time frame rather than a pause in the, the theory of the investability of it all. Um, right now, what we're hearing from executives is really the greatest obstacle to scaling up these businesses right now is, as you said, returns compared to what they're getting from conventional fuels, but also customer willingness to pay here, um, really finding those customers who are willing to pay or policy that is, you know, enabling um, sort of covering the spread, that green premium, to enable these technologies to take off at, in a scaled way. So I do think it's a matter of timing here, um, but right now we do see some caution given the interest rate environment. Uh, Kate, we did get um, the SEC finalizing those climate disclosure rules a, a few weeks ago. Um, scope 3 not necessarily included in that, and that is, of course, downstream emissions. That is, by the way, makes up the largest chunk of most companies and their emissions output. Um, do, do you get the sense that companies are, I guess the question is, what is the conversation that you're having with companies around this? How much they're going to have to invest? Do they have the infrastructure in place to be able to meet these disclosure rules? And the fact that Scope 3 was admitted, is that on their end, when they don't necessarily have the investments up front, is that seen as a positive, even if it's not a good a positive for climate? So I think companies have been organizing against this for a while. I mean, many of the largest companies in the world have been reporting some of this information voluntarily, in any case, to this to CDP, formerly known as the Climate Disclosure Project. So they are developing some expertise. However, there have been some who have not really gotten into the game. So I think as we look at the SEC regulations and regulations in Europe and in some parts of Asia right now, again, the direction of travel is clear there. A lot of these companies are also international companies. So even though scope three may not be a requirement in the US, it certainly is in Europe and in some of these other geographies as well. So what we see happening right now is companies really mobilizing for compliance. So getting the software as a service providers in place, making sure they have good tracking within their company to really get that granularity on emissions. But where we're most interested in talking to companies is really the climate risk part of some of these disclosures. So this is not just about physical risk, sort of where your operations are happening or where you may consider investment in the future, but it's also about what we call transition risk. So what, how is the regulatory environment gonna shape up? What are some of the big changes and sort of durable um, weather patterns that are gonna influence the performance of your transmission infrastructure, for example? So I do think that the standardization of disclosure is going to be a very positive thing for investors because Prior to this, we really didn't have kind of comparable metrics to think about how companies are performing on this. And I really do appreciate the focus on carbon because that's really where we see um, most investors being the most focused on wanting to see progress. And so Kate, um, from this research, it showed that executives from every region ranked North America as a more attractive region for investment than Europe, and that included executives within Europe. So despite some of the, the policy and regulation issues, 
Why do you think they're so drawn to, to North America, especially given that we do have a presidential election this year, which could change some of the dynamics? I think there are a couple of reasons. Um, so first, the Inflation Reduction Act and the, the number of different um, infrastructure policies in place in the U.S. right now are really providing a pretty impressive stimulus on the supply side to get some of those new energies out there. Um, so that's one reason. Second is we have an extremely low price of natural gas um, right now in the U.S. as an input. So I think those things are a, are a bit in balance right now, um, as many of the companies who are here at Sierra Week are in, continuing to invest in deployment of conventional resources, but also really looking at energy transition technologies. I think something in the U.S. that's going to be really interesting to follow um, over the next several years is really how we consider stimulating the demand side of all of this new supply that's coming online. And a lot of the interesting discussions we're having here around things like hydrogen, right, are, okay, there are a number of investors who are very interested and willing to invest in building out that supply chain, but where is the offtake gonna be? I think that's gonna be an interesting tension um, to resolve in the US in the next few years. And Kate, one of the things of note is AI being seen as a difference maker. How do you see that being deployed here? So AI certainly is the, the topic of the moment. I mean, it was at Davos as well. Um, I think that right now energy executives are really thinking about how to use AI and sort of its predecessor machine learning on improving maintenance and production and supply chain. Um, not quite so sure yet um, what some of those applications are going to be for emissions reductions. But I think that as we see adoption of this new technology increase over time in terms of ability to exploit resources and think of new areas to generate wind power, for example, I think we're going to see more and more different sorts of adoption. Um, and I think that's what's exciting about the technology. So um, I hear it being called a game changer. It may be. Right now, we're definitely in a test and learn phase, and there's certainly a lot of excitement around it. Indeed. Test and learn, show and prove, uh, always the case with AI. Appreciate you taking the time to join us from the conference there. Kate Height, Bain & Company partner and energy policy expert. Thank you so much. Thank you.